You can't be chaplain. The guy I hired did the best comedy drunk I ever saw. I don't pay 100 a week at juveniles. But the key to the art of learning to tell a story in visual terms on either film or video all rests in the birth of motion pictures, plain and simple. Two people that most influenced me to want to get into this business. The first was D.W. Griffith, and the show is slightly named after him, and Charlie Chaplin. When you consider that what had been movies up to a short period before that were custard pies and keystone cop chases and suddenly here was this incredible man this genius who said hey hey this isn't there are no limitations on this this isn't a peep show at the end of the seaside pier this is an art form so we're going to explore some of this because we were very lucky to have Richard Attenborough come to visit us here. He was, he was a passionate man, Charlie. Passionate in, in his beliefs, passionate in his life, passionate in his affairs. Passion, passion, commitment drove Charlie. Chaplin! I'd like to touch on um, some impressions of some of the directors uh, that you've worked with, people like Robert Aldridge and... Yeah. Uh, David Lean, uh, huh? the folks that primarily okay. focus on, on okay. the film. How often do we reload or don't we reload? It'll be one hour straight through. Either one yeah. Okay. <coughs> Carter. Yeah. You could go out and do your shopping, sweetheart. It would be an hour. Isn't it? Yeah, no, but, I mean, you sure? Yeah. You and Deb could take the car. Yeah. Darling? Yeah. Darling, we're going to be an hour, an hour and a quarter, something if we're going to see... You okay? Great. So Richard Attenborough, congratulations on your new feature film, Chaplin. Thank you, John. As well as your 50th anniversary in the motion picture business, <laughs> which was <laughs> starting uh, in, as your appearance in, in which we serve, the David right. and Noel Coward right. film, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, Chaplin, um, his extraordinary uh, biography, you've of course made several extraordinary biographical films. What was it that attracted you to this particular subject? Uh, well, <coughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't read fiction very much. I, I read biography, I read history, I read social history. And the world around me and uh, what's going on around me is, is what interests me. And um, I'm fascinated by the people who've changed our attitude towards accepted uh, authority, accepted criteria in relation to the manner in which we conduct our lives in our supposed civilized society. I'm fascinated by those who've revealed things to us in terms of human relationship and the way we view each other's problems and so on. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to make a film uh, in the usual genre that I'm in of, of, uh, of biopics, whatever the terrible word is that they're called. And I wanted to make a film about Thomas Paine. And I worked a long time, over two years, with a marvelous writer called Trevor Griffiths, who wrote Reds. And unfortunately, terrific script though it is, uh, the deal that I had was with Universal. And Universal, when they finally got it, and looked at a possible budget. The budget was, oh, 65, 70 million. I mean, there was no way in which they were going to go forward with it. I mean, they knew what the subject was. They knew we'd got the American War of Independence and the French Revolution, so it wasn't going to cost a few bob, you know. <laughs> it was going to be quite expensive, but nevertheless, it was too much. And my partner in my company, a very old friend um, called Diana Hawkins, who had worked well, we've worked together on and off for 30 years or so. Um, she was as devastated as I was. And when we got back home, 
uh, to England, she decided to uh, go into a corner for a couple of days, and we weren't quite sure what she was up to. But she apparently wrote down a number of things which interest me. Biography, uh, the movies, uh, people who've affected our lives, etc., etc., etc. And then the following day after she'd written these down, she was at a meeting, she told me, and she suddenly wrote down CC. And she read Charlie's autobiography. She read, whether she read them both, I'm not sure at that time, but she certainly read Charlie's autobiography. She wrote, read the definitive biography by David Robinson. And she wrote a 20-page outline, and she gave it to me. And it was one of the most marvelous presents I've ever had in my life. Um, I, 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 I couldn't believe why I hadn't thought of it before, you know. Because being, as I say, interested in biography and fascinated by, uh, by my business, the business that I'm in, by the business that I've lived in for this half century, it seemed a natural. And yet, I immediately thought, well, I suppose the reason that nobody's done it is that Charlie didn't want a movie made about it, and perhaps Una didn't want one made after he died. However, I'd met Charlie in the 50s, and uh, as a result of that, he and Una asked if I would take Annie, one of their daughters, as a trainee on A Bridge Too Far, which is a picture I directed. And uh, I did, and so I got to know Annie and her sister, Vicky, and I rang the girls in Paris and said, asked them what they thought. And they repeated that, that Mummy had always said no, but they felt that there was perhaps a chance, since I knew Daddy, and Daddy was very sweet to me and very generous to me, uh, and that Mummy uh, could practically recite uh, uh, the screenplay of Gandhi, that perhaps I had a chance. Anyway, the great thing was to ask Geraldine, and Geraldine was the boss. So I rang Geraldine, who I'd never met, oddly enough, in Madrid, and Geraldine said, well, I don't know, she said, I mean, uh, in theory the, has, the answer has to be no, but uh, if anybody could persuade Mummy, I'm sure you probably could, write to us, I wrote to her. I got an immediate reply saying the answer was yes, and when I asked for an explanation, apparently in debate she'd said, well, somebody's going to make it sooner or later, better to have someone make it who I know and who I think we'll do a truthful movie, then leave it to chance. But she said, there is one condition. So I thought, oh my God, it's going to be that, you know, her son is to play Charlie or somebody else is to write the script or whatever. Not a bit of it. The condition was that there were no conditions. She didn't want to know who was playing it. She didn't want to know who wrote the script or who was going to write the script. She, she didn't want any part of it whatsoever. She didn't even, I think, want to see the movie, necessarily. No chapter of his life was taboo? None, is none, nothing. And uh, she said, look, I, I, I will try as well as I may uh, to be objective, but I know it won't work. I know it'll be impossible. There will be things which subconsciously I will marginalize or accentuate, or, and they'll be wrong. You must make your film. But in furtherance of my desire that you should make a totally honest film and make your film, you can come to Veve. You can come to the home, to the family home in Switzerland, and the archives are open to you. 18 mil, 16 mil, stills, scripts, anything you want, private letters, diaries, nothing was taboo. And so it was the most wonderful gift at the end of the day um, that Diana had given me, and, and we set about taken us four, four, four and a half years, something like that. And the movie is the result of that idea of hers. So in terms of the research alone, uh, it's a staggering mm. task mm. to obviously see all the films, mm. uh, the diaries. I mean, it must have been just a wonderful, you know, illuminating view of Chaplin. You, there must have been things about Chaplin that you hadn't known. Yes, I, I, I think there were. I mean, I have to say that I didn't have to start at zero, as it were. Um, when I was 11, in the early 30s, uh, my dad, we, we lived in the, in the Midlands, in the middle of England, and, and he brought me up to London. 
uh, to go to, some, to the National Gallery, but also, as he put it, to see a genius. And the genius that he took me to see was Chaplin. And it was a cinema, it doesn't exist anymore, or well, the building does, but it didn't call that anymore. It was called the London Pavilion in Piccadilly Circus. And they were showing the gold rush. And uh, when I was five or six or eight or whatever it is, I wanted to be an actor. But if somebody said, what actually confirmed that passion of yours? It was seeing that movie. I'm quite sure about that. And I've said this over 20, 30 years. It isn't just related conveniently to this movie. Um, and I, 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 I remember, oy, I remember crying with laughter. You know, I mean, laughing so much that I thought I couldn't watch the screen almost. You know? And then, of course, he made me really cry. And I thought, well, that's magic. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. That's incredible. And then, as I say, I met him in the 50s. So it, I, didn't have to, I didn't have to start from scratch. From the moment I saw the gold rush, I saw everything, everything that was available to be seen. Of course, a number of them hadn't been made yet, but uh, those that had been made and that were available, I saw. Oh, it was... Uh, it was a revelation to me, an absolute revelation. And I, I'm profoundly ever in his debt, because I think in some measure, for good or ill, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Well, truly, uh, Chaplin was able to you know, blend humor with pathos, and to take slapstick and that type of humor a step further into a deeper humanity. And, and yeah. certainly a, a scene that, that it really comes to mind is, is, is the uh, finale of The Kid, oh, Jackie yeah. Coogan, which, Oy. of course, you use the clip in... Uh, in a yeah, devastating, isn't it? I mean, it's extraordinary that... Uh, somebody wrote an article the other day saying how embarrassingly sentimental uh, the end of The Kid was. I mean, they just are... I mean, they shouldn't write articles like that if they're not uh, knowledgeable of the context of that. I mean... You know, the period when that was written, when melodrama was only just coming to an end, you know, the, the, the Victorian era had, uh, had not been over long. And uh, that was, I mean, when you consider that what had been movies up to a short period before that were custard pies and keystone cop chases, and suddenly here was this incredible man, this genius, who said, hey, hey, this isn't, there are no limitations on this. This isn't a peep show at the end of the seaside pier. This is an art form. We can relate this to human beings. We can, we, we can, we can reveal, we can remove the onion skins. We can, we can show people's fallibilities, shortcomings, pains, passions, joys. We can show all that. Through real people, we can. I, 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 I know how, he said, you know, to relate people one to the other, and I know how through that to make statements in entertainment terms, small e, but in entertainment terms, because that's what we're in. Uh, I, I can make statements about what I believe is good, bad, evil, you know, something ought to be challenged. That's what he did. He, he transformed the cinema, not into uh, his, his uh, citation, as you know, said that he made an, it turned an industry into an art. And I think Charlie would have been apprehensive about the word art because Charlie believed that the movies were for everybody. They weren't, they weren't in a, uh, elitist in any sense. And that sometimes art, the word art, seems to define. He meant through this magical instrument that photographed people that could then display these extraordinary magical images on that white spot at the end of a black tunnel, you know. It, uh, Oh no, he was he was staggering, absolutely staggering in in the steps, and he permitted the rest of us, with due humility, I hope, you know, at the bottom of the mountain, to to be able to follow in his footsteps. And he was truly a, a very responsible filmmaker, uh, uh, commenting on, on social issues in modern times, the great dictator in particular, which um, caused some degree of friction between uh, Charlie and his brother Sid, which of sure. course is portrayed in the film. Sure. Um, was, was that relationship um, something that, that he wrote about candidly uh, in some of his memoirs? With Sid? Yeah. Yes, I think it was. Sid, you see, Sid was, uh, Sid was a very remarkable figure in many ways. 
uh, he was a performer, a relatively star performer, long before Charlie, both with Fred Carnell and indeed on the screen. And, uh, but he was a very good businessman. People say that Charlie was a, a very shrewd businessman, and certainly he was no fool. But I think he owed an enormous amount to Sid. But the mo remarkable thing about Sid was that despite his own career and potential, he recognized that his young brother was uh, uh, in a class of his own. And he voluntarily gave up his career uh, in order to look after Charlie and to run the whole Chaplin outfit. Uh, he was a, a mysterious figure in, in some degree because, as you will know, large numbers of people uh, assume that Charlie was Jewish. Uh, Charlie was not Jewish. Uh, although the uh, Hoover files, <coughs> like a no Thornstein, I think they had him down as, that Chaplin was a phony name, they said, that his real name, I think it was Thornstein, something like that anyway. But Sid was half Jewish. In other words, Charlie's mother was Sid's mother, but she obviously had an affair with somebody who was Jewish. So that I'm very fond of the scene in the movie where Sid, having badgered Charlie to, to, to go into talkies, to move into talkies, as many other people did. This was in the middle 30s. Uh, you, you must advance, Charlie. You, you mustn't be sub, sub, um, con, uh, uh, contained. You mustn't be... Uh, 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 go with the times. Yeah, I've got, I can't think of the word I want. Uh, constrained, uh, you know, by, by, uh, by not going into movies. You must go into movies. Uh, into, into talkies, I mean. And, and Charlie, of course, finally gave in on a subject which was the great dictator. And, uh, and uh, Sid was furious with him because everybody said, don't make this film. Uh, there were over 90% of Americans said that the United States should stay out of the war. Once war was declared, of course, Charlie was suddenly a genius. But my point is that in the argument, when Sid was getting furious with him, he said, what are you doing? This isn't your world. Why are you? You're, you're, a, you're a comic. And Charlie said to Sid, he said, and, and yes, and yes, Sid, you are a Jew. In other words, we've just seen on the screen Nazism, fascism, or all, all the anti-Semitism uh, manifestation in, in, under, under Hitler, and, uh, and that's what he was saying. He, he, was, he was a passionate man, Charlie, passionate in in his beliefs, passionate in his life, passionate in his affairs. You know, passion, passion, commitment drove Charlie. And I'm going to be very stubborn and single-minded to be literally the only major filmmaker to wait a good 12 or 13 years after everyone else started making talking pictures. Sure. In fact, City Lights and Modern Times. Both. Absolutely. Although they're not, as I, I, in watching those films and, and thinking about them, you, as with many of his officially silent films, you, you seem to hear them. And have that, <laughs> yes. that quality. Yes, yes. And of course, as you know, he, he scored uh, all the major movies uh, while he was in Switzerland, when he ostensibly retired. Uh, I think it had something to do with maintaining the copyright, mind you. You know, that uh, copyright r had run out, but by putting music on, he renewed that copyright. What were the circumstances of your meeting with, with the real Charlie Chaplin? Um, well, in the 50s when I met him, I mean, it was a sort of ridiculous situation. It was slightly embarrassing for me to tell, but you asked the question. Uh, I was uh, in a restaurant in the south of France called Villeneuve de, Lu de Lube, Ville Villeneuve Lube, I think it was called. And uh, my wife and I had our children with us, and, and we went into a restaurant really quite early because of the children. And there was another family sitting over, the only other big table occupied with a lot of children. And obviously, they were there for the same reason, in order to get the children to bed at a reasonable hour. And the, the, they got up, and the man got up, he had white hair, turned up, and it was Chaplin. And I might have been seeing Beethoven or, you know, Shakespeare or, I mean, I, I, was, I was totally dumbfounded at suddenly being confronted with this god of mine, hero of mine, 
and he was good evening and walked out and suddenly got to the door and Una obviously said something to him and he came back into the restaurant and he said how do you do it? He said um, my name is Charlie Chaplin you're Richard Attenborough aren't you? I, you're a very good actor I admire your work very much. which I mean hey I mean <laughs> I didn't care I was on the cloud seven you know I was uh, thrilled to death and then as I told you having just met him on that one occasion he then wrote and asked if I or rang I, I don't remember and asked if I'd take Annie and then in the 70s um, I'm uh, one of the officials of the British Academy of Film and Television Arts BAFTA and we gave uh, Charlie a fellowship very properly he should have been number one but he came to England and he came quite a lot at that time it was the time he got his knighthood and, uh, and we made him a fellow and so on and because I, w I hosted that event and the Queen came to open the new building and at that time she presented him with his fellowship and it was a very romantic time and very nostalgic and so on and so he came to England quite a lot during that period and stayed at the Savoy Hotel and I used to always go and see him he used to send a message to say that he was coming and would I like to come and say hello and so on so I knew him as a very old man I mean I knew him in his uh, middle eighties and although he was not senile in any sense he he nevertheless uh, his attention span was uh, was not great and you you couldn't really talk about anything of any great depth uh, he wanted to talk he wanted to chat uh, except when Una left the room and you'd be sitting with he and Una and and Una, I'd be talking to you, and Una would be sitting here, maybe, and Una would get up and go into the bedroom or something. And so although he'd be talking to you, his eyes would actually stay on the bedroom the whole time. He'd continue to talk to you, but, but Una was over there and had gone out of that door, and really it was difficult for life to continue quite, and oh, then she's back, and the back came the, the focus. It was, in, it was enchanting, yeah. He was in a chair, of course, in a wheelchair.